Good morning, everybody. This is Pastor Mike with another Watchman Pure Bible Study. We're going to finish out our study uh, today in the book of 1 Peter, finally. And uh, we're going to move. We're just going to go right across the page, right over into 2 Peter. And got a lot of I, I, what I think is neat things to show you. But let's get right into the study. Time's running out. 1 Peter chapter 5, we dealt with verse 8, where it says, uh, Be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, we talked about that last week, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. <clears throat> we dealt with all those issues the last two weeks. But verse 9, I think, is, is the important part here. Because it not only, verse 8 is warning you uh, to be sober and to be vigilant, to be, uh, to be careful about the duty that God has given us to perform, uh, to be soldiers in his army, to be watchmen on the wall. Uh, but he's also telling us that it is possible to resist and to fight and to ward off this devil. He says in verse 9, Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Now the thing that I get out of this, uh, it is he, he's telling us that we can resist. In fact, he's telling us, uh, to resist this lion, this devouring thing that uh, we see in our lives, we see in our country, uh, we're to resist these things. We're to, we're to withstand. Uh, you know, you, you start looking at words in your King James uh, to stand, to stand. Paul always talked about how we ought to stand, how we ought to stand, to withstand. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. To stand, to stand, to stand, and not move. Uh, I, I've taught about this on, uh, on several videos. I talk about this in conferences where I go, especially when I'm dealing with pastors. I get invited every year down to Harrison, Arkansas, and uh, uh, some of the videos that we have done, we've, uh, we've done down there. Uh, but it's usually just a lot of preachers in a room together. And I'm, I love getting around God's men. There's, there are still some good, good old-fashioned Bible-believing preachers out there. And uh, we're becoming a scarce item, but there's still plenty of them out there. And I love these men, but I, I go to encourage them, to teach them. Uh, and a lot of times that we sit through uh, hours and hours of preaching, and I'm always encouraged by them and learn a lot uh, from these guys as well. Uh, but I encourage them, and if I go to their church, I encourage them to stand, to don't move. God has called us in these last days to remain faithful, to be steadfast, to not move, to not be, un, uh, to not be shakeable, uh, because I believe that at some point, and according to the book of Hebrews, and we studied this uh, in our church on Wednesday night Bible study, where God said, I think it's in Hebrews 12, where he said that he's going to shake the earth once more. Uh, and when he shakes the earth, all of those things that are movable and shakeable are going to be shaken and sifted out of the way. And yet God's people, God's true people, are going to be able to resist steadfast. You know, I'm going to follow the Lord's leading here, and I'm, going to, uh, I'm just thinking some thoughts here. I want to turn to uh, Mark chapter 4, because I think this gives us a good idea of what it is I'm talking about, about resisting steadfast, being faithful, and remaining faithful, and uh, not being like some of the, not like being like lost people out in the world, and definitely not being like a lot of church members in the world. I'm getting a little tongue-tied this morning. It's early. Uh, I had a good night's rest last night, but I wish I had about four or five hours more. You know how it is, don't you? Just some days you just wake up and say, boy, I want to go back to sleep. Uh, but anyway, I'm glad, I'm excited to be here with you. Mark chapter 4, he gives us the parable of the seed and the sower. And then he gives the interpretation of that parable. And he says uh, in verse 14, the sower soweth the, the word, which is the word of God, the, the Bible. And he said, verse uh, 15, and these are they, uh, uh, these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. A lot of people that you witness to, uh, whether you do street preaching or door knocking or you pass out tracts or you give out uh, videos uh, from our ministry or anybody else's or your, pre your pastor preaches sermons and you give tapes or CDs out or you just share a Bible tract with somebody. You may, they may hear a verse from you. They may read a verse in the tract or, or somehow, some way, 
They may be watching a football game and see John 316 up on a banner at a football game. They may, they may see that. Uh, but the devil comes immediately into their lives. Um, and it's not like he hasn't been there all along. But he's there, that old, that old buzzer, that old turkey vulture, that, that, uh, that raven <clears throat> is perched on their shoulder. And as soon as the seed of the word of God is dropped in their life, he is, he is consuming it all up. He is a devourer of the word of God. And so he steals that away from them so that it cannot take root uh, in their hearts. Verse 16, and these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness, but have no root in themselves. I, I just wonder how many of, of our church members uh, in this country or in the world, how many church members, how many church people have absolutely no root in them whatsoever. They have no root whatsoever. And um, we have, uh, I don't know how things are, in your, but I, I always operate on illustrations that I know. And uh, <clears throat> in my backyard is a septic tank. I don't know if you know what that is, but that's like this big, massive concrete vault buried underground where all of our sewage runs into. And um, I won't go any further than that. Uh, but anyway, uh, when we buried that thing, I remember <clears throat> the guy came out and dug the hole and we buried that thing. Uh, he hit rock and he had to lay it right on top of the rock. So right on top of this concrete vault that's buried underground behind our house is about that much dirt, not, not very much at all. And uh, boy, in the springtime, you know, grass grows and everything's nice and green and you can't tell anything at all. Uh, but July hits, August hits, and the rains dry up. Uh, September, like it is right now, it's kind of dry here. And uh, as soon as that rain has gone away from the top of that, of that septic tank, well, there is a, there is a, I have a brown rectangle in my backyard. Because the, the grass there, it cannot take root because of the stony ground, literally, that's underneath it. And it, it eventually dies and decays away and turns basically into nothing. And this is, I would say, probably a good, good percentage of most church people in this country. We're not, now we're not talking about all the lost people, the, the beer guzzlers and the party crowds and everything else, or the false, uh, the false religion people. We're talking about people who, are, who would categorize themselves as Christians, whether they are or not, that's up to God to judge. But they definitely attend service somewhere, whether it's in a, you know, some kind of Protestant church, Catholic church, or whatever. They have no root in themselves whatsoever, and the sun beats down on them, and uh, they are just, uh, they're just burn away with a fervent heat. And so these people are, the, are ones that cannot resist steadfastly, because they have no ability to stand. They have, no, they have no system in their life whereby they are nourished in their life and they will soon fade away. <clears throat> um, let's see here, verse 17. They have no root in themselves and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake. Boy, I tell you what, I, I'm just, uh, I'm glad I'm chasing a rabbit this morning. I, I didn't plan on going this direction, but I feel like the Lord is leading in this direction. Uh, in that, uh, when you look at this, when affliction or persecution ariseth, I, I am one, and, and I have said that First Peter is about persecution to the church in the last days. If I were to go back to First Peter here, and say, it says in verse 10, we haven't got to that verse yet, but it says, But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Persecution, my friend, is not our enemy. It is our friend. It is God's way. Uh, of course, we are redeemed by Christ's blood, and there's, there's no way around that. We are saved by the grace of God. But he mentions the grace of God here in the same context of mentioning our suffering. Christians, by their very calling, by their very nature, are, are are chosen by God to follow Christ in his sufferings, to follow after him so that God could work a work in our life, so that we, he could make us perfect, 
He can establish us. And, and let, me, uh, let me chase another rabbit. I've got so many rabbit trails going here. Um, I learned a long time ago, I like etymology. I like to study the, the roots of English words. And uh, I was reading a dictionary one time. Honest to goodness, I was reading a dictionary. And it had a little article of being in this dictionary about how we got our words in English. And it said that there is a Latin root word that consists of the letters S-T-A. Uh, variations of that would be S-T-E or S-T-O or things like that. And anything with S-T-A basically means um, something that doesn't move or cannot move. And so it started listing words in English that we have gotten that have S-T-A in it, like uh, establish or stable, things that don't move. A statue doesn't move. A statute is a law that is not intended to, to change. It is, it is steadfast. Um, uh, I could go on forever. Just think of words with S-T-A in them or S-T-E or S. Stop. The word stop is a derivative of that, and it means don't move. So think about this for a while. When we look back at verse 9, it says, Whom resist steadfast in the faith. So I just wanted to throw that in there. But we're, 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 we're going to be persecuted in this earth. Whether you're being persecuted, uh, let's say you're being persecuted by your wife or your husband or you're pers being persecuted by your children uh, who are rebelling against God and they're, they're laying all their problems and woes upon you. Or you, you might be persecuted at work. You might have lost a job because you decided that you weren't going to go a certain way. I've, I've heard people all the time tell me, you know, I lost my job because they were asking me to do things dishonest and I couldn't do it that way. They sent me out the door. Uh, we will be persecuted in this life, and if, if in small ways like that, or, or there, there just might be a time in this earth when they come and get us, and they come after us because we decided we weren't going to bow down to the image that Nebuchadnezzar set up. We were not going to bow down to a New World Order system or anything like that. We will be persecuted. There is no doubt in my mind, and First Peter was written... I believe to tell us, to enable us, to, to help us along, to show us that just because we haven't been translated yet doesn't mean, number one, that we're not going to, and number two, doesn't mean that God has forgotten about us or that he's angry with us in some way. Now, if you've sinned and you've willfully disobeyed the law of God and you uh, are contrary to his ways in your life, then God will chasten you. But that's not persecution. That's, that's God being a good dad to you. God's bending you over his righteous knee and whooping the fire out of you because of your sin. That's not persecution. Persecution, and we talked about this in 1 Peter, is, is for those who are trying to live a godly life and the world hates you and the devil hates you. It's not that you're going to go out and do some great thing for the glory of God and the devil's trying to put a stop to it. He is going to persecute everyone that tries to live a godly life. So we go back to, uh, to Mark. Uh, it says, When affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, and I would say that, number one, that, in, that implies, number one, those who are born-again Christians, but number two, now get ready, those who hold that the Bible is the word of God it is without error. It does not need translating again. It does not need correction, although it should be correcting us, not us, it. And I don't know where these guys get that. The Bible is so plain to me now that we're not to correct the Word of God. I do not correct this Bible. I do. Not, you will not hear me ever say in a sermon, a Bible study, a teaching, a prophecy conference. I won't say it to my wife. I, you will never hear me say. Now, you know, you know, in, in original Greek, it should be better said this way, or a, a better translation is this, because I don't think there is a better translation than this. What I have right here. And I can tell you that we are under the we are we are headed toward persecution in this country, especially because of our stand on the issue of the King James Bible. We believe that it is the infallible, inerrant Word of God. And you know as well as I do that every other church out there is, is going away from these things. Try to find a church. People have called me and emailed me and said, Pastor Mike, we cannot find a church. We, we're trying to look for a King James Bible-believing church. 
We can't find one anywhere. It's difficult, and uh, I feel sorry for them. I really do. Hey, you guys can move to Festus, Missouri. I'll, we'll take you in, and we'll, we'll be good to you, all right? Uh, but anyway, they're going to be persecuted for the word's sake, and it says, immediately they are offended. I have pastored this church uh, for, I've been here for 15 years. I pastored a church, a little church out in the country for about three years before that. I've been in church all my life. I have seen people offended. I've seen people, I have seen people offended legitimately in the church. You know, church people can be pretty offensive. I have learned a lot of lessons in life. I, I, am, I am and can be a very offensive person. Um, either in my mouth or my actions. I have offended people. We were, uh, I was preaching this here a couple Sundays ago, take you away the stone, and uh, we, we're offering that. We have that sermon uh, as part of our watchers packet we send out every month, but I'm probably going to post that on the, on the internet at some time because I think it's a valuable sermon, but it talks about how the stone of, a, stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. We lay stones of stumbling in front of people. There's no doubt about it. But I've also seen people in the church that are offended at small things. They're offended uh, when a pastor says, you cannot dress this way, you cannot live this way, um, you know, or you shouldn't do this. It's not that he's some dictator ruling their life. It's, he's, just, he's just laying out the word of God for them. But they get offended at some of the most Mickey Mouse mundane things that anybody's ever heard of. And the reason why is that they have no root whatsoever. They are dried, parched grass laying there just waiting for something to devour it up. These are the, I've, I have seen these people come in and out of the church over the years. You probably know exactly who I'm talking about. And I will tell you this because I, I will tell you this because I love you. If you are this kind of person, uh, repent. Number one, repent of the fact that you're constantly looking to be the victim of somebody else. And, and I know people like this. They are constantly looking for the next offense to come their way. The Bible says, great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Did you know that if you will just love the word of God and, and love the precepts given by God and, and have them as your thought and your mainstay in your life, that just things that used to offend you won't offend you anymore. And I'll tell you that when they start coming after us, that's going to be an offensive act. And they are going to come after us. And there will be persecution in this world that we live in. And I believe that it could happen in my lifetime. And I would say, you know, we always have this scenario. What if we're in church and guys and with guns come in and say, are you going to worship? I mean, those guys mean to offend because they want to take the people who have no root in them whatsoever. And they want, to, they want them to just blow away and go away. Uh, God's people, hopefully you're on the red list. And if you don't know what that is, uh, there's this conspiracy theory that says that everybody's on a list. And red list people, they know, that they know, you know who they are. They know that they're not going to be able to deal with us red list people. So they're going to come in and shoot us right off the bat. Well, glory, hallelujah, you know. Uh, the one thing they can't do is they can't take away your spiritual birthday, all right? You're saved by the grace of God and nothing else. But anyway... Uh, back to resisting steadfast in the faith. You know, I'm having fun here. I'm waking up, as it were. Um, these people who have no root cannot resist. They cannot resist because they have no root. And then he, then he talks about in verse 18, Jesus is telling us, and these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word. And the cares of this world, number one, I like to count things, the cares of this world, number one, the deceitfulness of riches, that is, that is the word faith movement at its core, is the deceitfulness of riches is in the word faith charismatic movement. Number three, the lust of other things. Three things here, three strand DNA, think about it. Entering in, choke the word, and it become unfruitful. And you know what happens. You know what happens. Jesus himself teaches us what happens to unfruitful vines or unfruitful trees. Uh, Jesus said they're to be cut down and cast into the fire. Now, I didn't say that. Jesus said that. If you look at Mark chapter 4, and, and there's, another, there's a parallel to this in Luke, you will find out, you will clearly see, and I've, I, have a, I have a message on this. I preached it twice in our church. It's called Three Out of Four. And if you look, there are four groups of people here. There's the, the, those, the seed that fell by the wayside. Those are people that the devil just came and gobbled it up. 
lost people. Lots and lots and lots. There's, there's lots of wayside people out there. There are the, um, the Stony Ground church members. There are the, the, the Thorn church members. And then there are the Good Ground church members. And um, three out of four of these groups don't make it to heaven. They don't make it. One group does. They're the ones who have the, who have the good ground. They've had the plow of the Word of God plowing up their ground. That's what I encourage preachers to do. Turn this, turn this sword into a plowshare and take this sword of the Word of God and, and turn it into a plowshare, preacher, and you plow up the hard ground in people's lives. That means you preach it hard and sometimes you preach it mean, but you do it in love because you want to save people, not run them off. But you plow up the stony ground in people's lives so that they can bear fruit in their lives. Uh, but anyway, three out of the four of these groups don't make it. The, the fourth group does. The fourth group has the ability. Now we go back to 1 Peter. The fourth group are the ones who actually have the ability to resist steadfast because it says, whom resist steadfast in the faith. And if you are not in the faith, you cannot resist him. There is no way that you can resist the devil. He has power. He has, he has tremendous power. He has power. We see in the book of Job, he has, he has power. He, has, he had power to kill all of Job's family, to, uh, to uh, cause uh, people to come in and steal his, his substance. He, God eventually gave him authority to have power over Job's own flesh. And he would have killed Job had God allowed him to. He has power. God was holding him back. The whole word faith crowd does not believe that. They say uh, that, see, the devil can, can do anything you want to. You have to be powerful against him. No, God has to do that. But anyway, you cannot resist the devil if you are not in the faith. And let's keep this real simple here. Remember, I always teach my, my, my people some very, very simple things because things have to be simple for us. Number one, being in the faith means you read your Bible. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Number two, faith comes by asking, Lord, increase our faith. That was their prayer to Jesus. Lord, increase our faith. So if you ever find yourself in a situation where you are doubting, where you're not sure of, of the outcome, uh, where uh, you are in tribulation or trial or anguish, you are in fear. And I know about these because I experience all of these. I'm not sitting here as some super mentor who's conquered everything in his life. And I can tell you that if you'll just be like me, you'll be okay. Man, you don't want to be like me. I can tell you, maybe you already are, but I can tell you that that when I find myself weak in faith, when I find myself weak in, in, my, in my spirit, I know that I can ask God who giveth to all men liberally, and he will supply me with the faith needed. So whom resists steadfast in the faith? Number one, Bible reading. Number two, prayer. How's your prayer life? Number three, I believe faith brings about faithfulness. What are you talking about, Brother Mike? Faithfulness in your, in your church attendance, faithfulness in your prayer life, faithfulness in your Bible reading, faithfulness in your giving, faithfulness in stewardship. It is required of a man uh, that in stewards he be found faithful. You cannot resist. And I, let, me, let me just give you a quick illustration here before we close this out so, to, so you can understand this. I believe in tithing. I know there's some people out there who say, oh, tithing's under the law. I don't believe in tithing. I don't believe I have to tithe. Yeah, well, let me know how that works for you, okay? But I believe in tithing. I believe that it's not only part of the law, but it's part of the grace that God has given me. I want to give God at least 10% of the things that he's blessed me with. It is not, it's not a demand that God's uh, going to kill me if I don't do it. It's one of those things where I just believe that you ought to do it. And uh, God's blessed. But anyway, if, I, I promise you this. And he says this in Malachi too. When you don't tithe... When you don't give uh, the, way you're, the way God calls you to, uh, you're, you, we, we, we don't give for one reason. We don't give because we want to keep what we were going to give. Okay, It's called greed. Greed is probably the only reason why we don't give. It's because we're greedy. Okay. Um, 
Now, having said all that, we don't give because we're greedy. We want to keep this thing that we really, it's not ours to keep. So we hold on to it. God said in Malachi, he said, if you will stop robbing me and bring your tithes into the storehouse, God said, I will rebuke the devourer. Did you catch that? That's exactly what we see in verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And so if you don't want the devourer devouring your finances, your health, uh, your family, your wife, your husband, your church, your country, if you don't want the devourer to devour those things, then be in the faith. And if you are in the if you if if you if you are in the faith, well, I'm just thinking of all of different ways I can go here. If you are in the faith and being faithful to God in your prayer life, then devour won't come and steal away all your time. If you are faithful to God and committed to Him in your Bible study, then the devil won't come in and devour the Word of God that is in you and then replace it with a bunch of junk television shows that you shouldn't be watching to begin with. I mean, these things are pretty simple. If you are faithful to give according to God's plan for, for funding the church, for funding uh, ministers like me, my, my job consists, uh, my, my income, which is not big at all, consists solely of the free will offerings of people. I don't get a commission on every sermon. Uh, I'm not out selling uh, Amway out on the side trying to raise money for my family. Because I'm trying to follow the Bible in that it comes solely from the free will offerings of the people of our church. And so if you are faithful in that you give to your church, if you're faithful in that you pray, uh, and you're faithful in that you are, the, then the devourer will not come. God will rebuke him. And he will not come and devour away the substance of your life. See, this stuff is real simple if you just start thinking in the Bible's way. Who resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. And so what is common here is common elsewhere. There, nobody, there's not, the, peop, the American Christians are not better than the Kenyan Christians or the Chinese Christians uh, or the Australian Christians, although we think that we're better than because we win more Olympic medals every four years, but we're not better than anybody else. And if, I promise you, if, if there are Christians being persecuted in Uganda, then there just might very well be Christians that will be persecuted in the United States of America. Think about it. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. I'm ready for Christ to come down and straighten all this mess out. Boy, that would be great, wouldn't it? Uh, by Silvanus, who is Silas. By Silvanus, now get this, Silvanus or Silas is the one who's actually writing down everything Peter told him to write, okay? Uh, there was a word I learned in college, I think it's amanuensis or something, some, some, uh, the original Greek word, like I told you I wasn't going to say, a Greek word called amanuensis. These guys are writing down, you know, what Peter said. We know that Paul used one because we, we believe that his eyesight was poor. So in Galatians, Paul says, uh, see with what large letter I've written with my own hand. That was like Paul's seal of approval. Silas is now telling you, uh, this was written by my hand here, a, a faithful brother unto you, as I suppose. You see, not only did Peter have to be faithful as an apostle, but the writer, the actually physical hand writer of the book of 1 Peter was faithful as well. I'm glad that faithful men, I'm glad that just faithful church members, the priesthood of the believers God used to preserve this old Bible for us. A faithful brother unto you, as I suppose I have written briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein you stand. Not only Peter is telling us about the grace of God, but here is Silas telling us about the grace of God. And we have two witnesses now that are testifying us about the grace of God in the midst of all of our persecutions and trials. He said, verse 13, the church that is, it's, I think it's neat that Babylon's in verse 13. That's another study. The church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you, and so doth Marcus, my son. Greet you one another with a kiss of charity. Peace be with you all that are in Christ Jesus. 
And all of God's people said amen. Next study, we're going to get into our study of the book of 2 Peter. I'll go ahead and give you a little advanced preview of this. The key to 2 Peter is found in verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of God. Um, and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us uh, to glory and virtue. That's sort of the key that sets the tone uh, for the rest of the book, and we'll get into that next week. I love you. I appreciate you. I, I, I pray uh, for you. I, I do. I, I, those that send me emails, though, that, that they give me a call every now and then, but I'm, I'm, I try, I'm trying hard to be more faithful about just praying for people, just praying for people in our church, praying for my family, but praying for people that I have never met that have been blessed by our ministry. And, and I'm, I'm being, I know you hear that from Kenneth Copeland and all these guys. We're, we're laying hands upon your prayer request cards and we're praying for you, bless God. I don't mean to sound like I'm just real spiritual because I'm not. But, uh, God has laid it in my heart to pray for you at times, and I want you to know I love you and I care about you, and though, though I've never met you, I, I love God's people. Looking forward to meeting some of you as we try to do some of our meetings across the country. Be praying about that. Be praying that God will give us uh, His success. Uh, this is Pastor Mike. I love you. God bless you. Bye-bye.